In March 2020, Manuel Ellis died while handcuffed in police custody. Three officers involved in the incident are on trial. Officers Matthew Collins and Christopher Burbank face second-degree murder and manslaughter charges. Officer Timothy Rankin is charged with manslaughter. All three have pleaded not guilty. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Christine Pei. Now, for the entire duration of the trial, King 5 has been recapping the biggest developments in the courtroom to discuss what it all means. And returning for our panel right now is attorney Mark Lindquist who served as a Pierce County prosecuting, pr prosecuting attorney for nearly a decade. Also joining us is retired Pierce County Superior Court Judge Brian Tollefson. And welcoming for the first time, former senior King County prosecutor and former criminal division chief in the Seattle Attorney's Office, Craig Sims. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you all, actually, for being here for one of our last discussions. It has been a, a more than two-month-long trial, so let's get into it. Let us now get back to King 5 Tacoma Bureau Chief Lionel Donovan about what happened in court this week. After more than two months of testimony, the jury is now deciding the fate of the three charged police officers. The jury has sent several questions to the court as they work behind closed doors to reach a verdict. The prosecution and defense made their final appeals to the jury this week. Special Assistant Attorney General Patty Eakes argued the police officers failed to follow their training. She played witness video of the night of Ellis's arrest and said it doesn't match up with the officer's narrative of Ellis having, quote, superhuman strength. You have three eyewitnesses who were there and not one of them sees that happen. They saw it from the beginning. They saw it when the officers were sitting inside their car and yet none of them describe Mr. Ellis picking up Officer Burbank or Officer Collins and throwing him into the intersection. Afterwards, the defense contradicted the state's experts and called the testimony of the civilian eyewitnesses into question. Wonder what's on the phones that they didn't want us to see. How about communication between them and Mr. Bible? Hey, here's what we know has been reported. If you can alter or con confront those facts, you might get some money. Who knows what their motivation is? However, a single phrase almost moved Judge Brian Chushkoff to throw out the entire case. During Eek's rebuttal, she stated, quote, if only he had been granted the dignity of being human and being responded to. Court rules prohibit the use of dehumanizing language by the attorneys to avoid establishing a bias against the officers. Chushkoff also accused Eeks of misrepresenting the evidence to the jury. The defense called for the case to be dismissed, and Chushkoff almost agreed. The same kind of approach was being done, and this is an African-American defendant, I, di I would dismiss this case for prosecutorial misconduct. You're, that's where you are. But Chushkoff ultimately decided to move forward with jury deliberations. However, when court went into recess, Christopher Burbank's attorney, Brett Pertzer, made racially disparaging remarks to James Bible, the Ellis family's attorney. In a letter, Pertzer apologized to the Ellis family for the comments, saying he was ashamed and called his behavior unacceptable. I spoke to Bible and he says he plans on filing complaints against both Osser and Pertzer for their comments to the Washington State Bar Association. Deliberations are scheduled to continue Monday morning at 9 a.m. From the Pierce County Courthouse, Lionel Donovan, King 5 News. So the case is now in the hands of the jury. The state always closes first, and special prosecutor Patty Eakes presented a simple common thread in front of the jury. Here is a part of what she said. And when someone else can't breathe, we help them. When any person tells us that they can't breathe, we help them. It's what reasonable people do because it's just so basic. Because breath is life. Manny Ellis didn't need to die. He didn't need to die while he was tied up like an animal with his pleas of, I can't breathe, sir, please. I can't breathe. 
So this was a return to the prosecutor's theme, first mentioned at opening statements more than two months ago. Eeks' statements also focused heavily on a central part of the state's case, of course, the eyewitness video. She cross-referenced the officer's statements with the footage, specifically noting for the jury where they did not align. And in one instance, Eeks noted that jurors could see, for example, that white plastic bag floating away in the video. She said that this was evidence that the eyewitnesses to the fight did indeed see the beginning of the confrontation because the bag was used to carry items that Ellis had just purchased from a nearby store. So this was all just one example of the state making their case. Much of their case also pointed out inconsistencies in the charged officer statements to investigators and what they testified on trial. Of course, for months, the jury heard the evidence presented, but it was in closing arguments when perhaps the jurors were able to connect the dots. We heard, I mean, this is already back in October, when we saw, when we heard from uh, prosecutors on their case, they didn't always spell it out, you know, when, you know, for people, to, for the jury to make the connections. This is pretty typical for it all to tie in together during the closing statements, Mark. Yep. You know, the prosecution, of course, has the burden of proof, so they have to tell a compelling and coherent story. And the closing argument is a chance to tie together seemingly disconnected bits of evidence in a way where the jurors go, ah, yeah, now I get it. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't see the reactions of the jurors' faces, but I didn't feel like the prosecution accomplished that as much as I would like to see. Uh, what they did do, what Patty did do effectively, was went right back to her theme. As yes. you noted, Christine, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, sir. And that's the strongest part of their case. It's sort of like we're coming full circle, right? Um, from the defense's point of view, how do you think, Craig, the uh, closing statements were from the prosecution side? Just your first reaction. Yeah, my first reaction when listening to the closing argument from uh, Special Prosecutor Eeks was that an opening statement, of course, she they pulled together a big picture to give the, a road map of where they expect to go during the trial. Yes. And then in closing argument, I think that Special Prosecutor Eeks did a, a very good job of piecing together the details and reminding the jury of the details and the facts of what they heard through the trial to help prove her case. Because when I was listening to it, I remember thinking like, aha, oh yeah, that was what you were meaning when you brought that up and so forth. So I could see where they really want to nail it. That's exactly the, the reaction you're hoping for from the jurors. Yeah. I just, we just aren't allowed to yeah. see the jurors. We couldn't see the jurors. I see, yeah. Yeah, and this, I, I don't think the prosecution's case was, was disorganized. They did a, they, they had a very logical movement of what they were doing during their case. And the, and one of them was to keep the, the jury, jurors' attention so they didn't put a lot of what I'll call kind of basic, dull, boring stuff all together. They interspersed it with eyewitness testimony and with in, very interesting expert testimony. Well, speaking of which, Judge, it appeared that the state had more objective evidence. They offered more eyewitnesses. They offered that video footage. Do you think that gives them a leg up in their case? Because video is very powerful. I mean, there's one thing to believe the eyewitnesses and what they're testifying, but you see it all play out in video. Do you think that's going to be their strongest point, Mark? Well, you know, I've been in trials so the defense did next to nothing. They didn't call any witnesses. They didn't present any evidence. Again, it's the prosecutor who has the burden to tell the coherent story. Defense just sits back and critiques. Yes. Now that said, in this case, the defense actually did more than I'm accustomed to seeing in a case. Now obviously in a homicide case, you're gonna get a stronger defense, uh, but they did bring out some objective evidence. For example, they referred to the picture of Officer Burbank's window, which has what appears to be powdered white mm -hmm. sugar on it, consistent with the officer's story. Sure. And what was even more significant about that is the prosecution had not presented that evidence. Mm -hmm. And as I've said earlier, the prosecutor has to present all the evidence, all the witnesses, and you do that for two reasons. One, to earn the trust of the jurors, and secondly, to steal the thunder from the defense. Certainly. And here they gave the defense that thunder, where the defense was able to get up there and, hey, look at this powdered sugar on the window objective evidence that's consistent with our story. Absolutely. Yes, John and I was going to say there, that another window they gave to the defense was when uh, especially Jared Osser stood up and gave his closing arguments. He uh, pointed out all the other per people that were on scene that could have come in and testified mm. who didn't come in and testify on behalf right. of the state. Right. And he, he talked about that a couple times during his closing argument. Certainly. And did you have any thoughts, Craig, on that? 
I'm thinking about the question that you asked, and I don't know if it's necessarily a matter of giving the prosecutor a leg up based on the information they presented. Mm -hmm. I think it's holding them accountable to their job, what they had to do to prove their case. And they have to prove their case, and they bear the burden to prove their case uh, by presenting objective evidence to the jury. Absolutely. One thing we do want to discuss here is that the state heavily focused on emphasizing that Manuel Ellis was uh, of someone's loved one. We're talking about a father, a son, a brother, and on the flip side, oftentimes the defense said Ellis, uh, when they were making their case, was a, quote, ticking time bomb, that he displayed superhuman strength and that he was growling and making animalistic noises. So we have these two portrayals, really, of Ellis, the victim. We have uh, the human being, the father, and we have also, from the defense side, someone who may have, quote, been portrayed less as a human. Do you have any thoughts on that strategy coming from the defense side? Yeah, oftentimes in these types of cases, when a person is killed, they are being discussed in a trial like this as if they are not a human being. They're oftentimes referred to as a suspect, or their humanity is oftentimes lost. And from my perspective, and based on my experience, I think our collective experience, mm -hmm. it's important that we humanize everyone in that courtroom as we're presenting the information. I think that's what was done, uh, or attempted to be done, rather, by the Special Prosecutor Eeks and her team in terms of just humanizing Mr. Ellis as opposed to referencing him as a suspect or someone who didn't matter. Certainly. Mr. Uh, Freaky, who yes. represented one of the uh, defendants, he was the first person to do opening or closing statements, and he pointed out the humanity aspects of Mr. Ellis's mm -hmm. life. He was, he, in fact, that was a big portion of his closing argument. Yes, I do recall Saying that we that. all feel bad about this. Yes, and he, I believe he was representing Officer Burbank, and he started off with that, probably knowing that that might have been the perception yes. on the defense side. Um, let's zoom in on the defense's closing arguments. The attorneys did their best to poke holes in the state's case. Multiple theories were presented as to why the officers are not responsible for Ellis's death. The defense maintains that Ellis died of a meth overdose and a heart attack and not because of the actions taken by officers. He had a heart attack and died because he had a dilated heart. He had 2,400 nanograms of methamphetamine in his system and his heart wouldn't pump the oxygenated blood to the body. That's what happened and that's not criminal. Attorneys also spent a great deal of time justifying the actions the officers took that night. They told the jury that Ellis was combative, assaultive, arguing that it was Ellis, not the officers, who initiated the confrontation. They don't know at that point that he's under the influence of methamphetamine. They don't know of his medical situation. All they know is they're being attacked by a guy out in the streets in a dangerous part of town, and they're acting accordingly. So it seems as if the defense was pushing two theories to the jury that they did not kill Ellis, but even if they did, that their actions were still justified. So let me open it up to everybody. What do you think of that strategy on the defense's end? Craig, I'll put it to start with you. That's expected. Yeah. Um, right. You expect to, the defense to attack every point uh, possible for the defense on the prosecution's case. And so them first determining what was the cause of death, I think that's a reasonable thing for them to do. And then if it's decided to determine that um, the officer has caused the death, it's now the next step is for the jury to determine whether or not the officers acted reasonably uh, within the scope of their authority. Sure. Did you have any thoughts, Mark? If the officers didn't cause the death, the jury doesn't even have to worry about whether right. or not the force was excessive. So if they can convince the jurors the officers didn't cause the death, they're home free. Yeah. And the other thing I will add is I mentioned earlier the defense did more in this case than you often see. You don't usually see two out of three criminal defendants testify, uh, but you did here. And I think the jury wanted to hear from them. I think the public wants to hear from them. Uh, officers are not normal criminal defendants. They're public servants. We have higher expectations for them. Yes. And you don't often see uh, criminal defendants put on their own experts either. And mm. in yeah. this case, they had yes. a lot of experts, criminal defense ex experts. Right. And go, so you're referring to Officer Burbank, who did not testify. Mm. We only heard from Officers Collins and Officer Rankin. You know, this kind of goes into my next line of questioning. As we know, there are three separate defense teams in this trial. We're talking about uh, three different defendants. It kind of adds to the complexity of all of this. At times, it seemed like the attorneys were asking questions on behalf of the, of, uh, the one of the defendants and not just their own clients. 
How closely do you expect they work together in this case, or could the officers have tried to place some blame on each other? I mean, we know that uh, officers Collins and Burbank, they both face the second degree murder charge, while Officer Rankin only faces a manslaughter charge. Was there any of that in play, you think, in, in this situation? Absolutely. Uh, from my perspective, uh, it would be irresponsible for the defense not to work together. Uh, because there's so many overlapping facts between the three of them, uh, the defense team, while the individual lawyers have responsibilities to their respective clients, uh, there is a lot of overlap and commonality between all three, so I think it makes sense for them to work together to the extent that it doesn't, they're not competing uh, with each other in terms of the interests of their respective clients. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah. they disclosed uh, right to the court in open court, you know, we want to take a, re a brief recess, Judge, because we want to, you know, have a little defense conference. Sure. Yes. I've seen cases where defense attorneys throw their respective clients mm. under the bus, you know, pointing fingers. We didn't see that here. You didn't see that any of that yeah. in this situation. I gotcha. Okay. So a major part of the case involved Ellis's past, his struggle with addiction, his previous interactions with law enforcement, even touching on his challenges with mental health. Do you think that information will be relevant at, at all to the jury as they deliberate? Obviously, that was a big part of the defense's case, is bringing up his past, uh, past run-ins with the law. How powerful do you think that is? I think it's very powerful. I mean, we were talking earlier about the defense is trying to put the blame for his death on the methamphetamine. And they're in front of a Pierce County juror, uh, jury, and the Pierce County jurors, believe me, know a lot about methamphetamine. Pierce County was one of the meth capitals uh, in the nation for a while. Yeah. And so they're going to take those negative feelings people have about methamphetamine, especially so in Pierce County, and put the blame there. And objective evidence that everyone agrees he was on a fatal or near fatal amount of methamphetamine that night, Mr. Ellis. Okay, well, let's return actually to something that Lionel Donovan had highlighted in his recap. This is the moment between Judge Brian Shishkoff and Patty Eeks after her rebuttal to the defense's closing. And at the end of her statement, Eeks said Ellis was not treated as a human. All three defense teams objected to Eeks' statement on this. Eeks stood by what she said, but the judge warned that he was close to siding with the defense's request for a dismissal of charges. You know, we heard that soundbite from him uh, in, in Lionel Donovan's reporting just moments ago. So, Judge, what do you make of this decision to not dismiss the case here? It sounds like this was a near thing for him. This was a very critical situation, it seemed, during that, that part. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, of course, every judge who has a big high-profile case has some of the thoughts that Judge Shishkoff enunciated going through the back of their mind. In other words, you know, do I really want to declare a mistrial? We've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of human emotion. These are all things that a lot of judges would think about before they actually want to grant or deny a mistrial. So yeah. in, a, in, a, in an obvious case where it's just so obvious you just can't ignore it, you're going to you're going to grant a, a mistrial trial, but this one, I, I think the judge was, I think he made the right decision to let it go to the jury. And he yeah. said why he wanted it to go to the jury. He said, the community wants to hear from a judge, not I mean wants to hear from a jury, not a judge. Yes. So let me let me turn it to both of you. Actually, um, this is not the first time we've heard this. We <laughs> this is the, one of the defense attorneys has brought this up um, a few times. What does this signal to you? This sounds like the judge must believe that the defense will, defense will still receive a fair trial. What were your thoughts when you heard some of this conversation happening? Uh, it was fascinating to me to, to, to watch the interactions between the judge and the respective lawyers. And on this specific issue, uh, I think all judges are very careful in terms of the record and understanding that what's going to happen with this trial, uh, the next step. If the individuals are convicted, there's a, a, a court, the next court that will uh, determine the appeal and look at the issues and see if the judge made any mistakes. So, of course, judges are going to be careful on that. Uh, but in this instance, it was, it was fascinating to me to watch the, the interplay between the judges. And I found it um, insightful in terms of some of the language and the way that the judge was speaking to Special Prosecutor Eeks. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear he was at his wit's end in terms of some of the things that, that he was dealing with with Special Prosecutor Eeks. Well, you're a former prosecutor yourself. Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm with Craig. I think we were more fascinated by this maybe than the general public was. But when the judge called Pat Eeks obtuse, yes. oh, well, yeah. uh, that sent me back in my chair a bit. Um, and here's the thing. Pat Eeks is a smart woman. Judge knows she's a smart woman. What he's really saying when he calls her obtuse is, 
you knew my orders, you ignored them. Certainly. And judges don't like that, especially, especially in a high profile trial and especially when the stakes are so high and the issue is so important. Yes, and you know, speaking of Patty Eeks, let's get into this a little bit. Patty Eeks also specifically stated that race, this is part of the conversation, that race was not part of the state's case. So what do you make of that decision? Because this is what Patty Eeks is obviously saying, but let's not deny the fact that people are thinking about this. They are thinking about race in this case. Do you have any thoughts on that, Craig? I have plenty of thoughts sure, on that. Sure, go ahead. So first, it's important to, to confirm and acknowledge that policing in communities of, of black and brown individuals has been hotly debated for generations. And that, to, from my perspective, cannot be ignored. And in looking at the entire landscape of this case and cases like it, race is, in fact, a key component that needs to be considered when we're looking at what, had, what occurred. But with that being said, as lawyers, especially as a prosecutor, there are guardrails or rules in terms of what you can present in court. And as lawyers, we are charged with the responsibility of presenting facts, factual information to the jury when they make their decision. And we are specifically admonished or told not to appeal to a jury's emotion when asking them to make a decision in the court of law. Mm -hmm. And if we are to have race as a primary focus in this case, uh, I think that that would be an appeal to a, a, a juror's emotion because race is an emotionally charged issue. Absolutely. Well, let's actually, so speaking of which, jury deliberations began, of course, yesterday, and if needed, they will have until December 22nd to deliberate, and then the court will go on recess until the new year. Um, can we actually uh, get into some of the charges here? Because um, part of the jury instructions, as Patty Eek said in her closing statement, is kind of a breakdown of what the charges are. So let's go through them really quickly, Mark, if you, we have our, our graphic up here for people to see. Two of the officers, Matthew Collins and Christopher Burbank, they are facing second degree murder charges. They both also face first degree manslaughter charges, while Timothy Rankin only faces the first degree manslaughter charge. Um, could you break down, it, it seems like a lot, Patty Eeks took a moment to emphasize that second degree murder, that charge was not in any way an intent to kill. Right, and even though she's correct legally, the reality is, as someone who's prosecuted homicide cases, including felony murder, I can tell you when the jury hears murder, they want to see some kind of bad intent. I do not see this jury coming back with murder convictions against these two officers because that bad intent, I think, is lacking, or at least the proof beyond a reasonable doubt that's going to get them there. Because just as a practical matter, again, we're talking about officers, a little different than your garden variety defendant. Uh, they're out there trying to do their job and they're going to get a little extra slack, I think. And so I don't see the jury branding these two as murderers right. uh, for that reason. So even though legally uh, the prosecutor constructed a legal argument that can get the jury to murder, as a practical matter, they're not seeing the kind of bad intent that jurors usually want to see for a murder conviction. There is the element of the uh, first degree manslaughter charge, which was completely separate situation. I believe that was relating to after Ellis was restrained. Um, but it sounds like the, the jury does have the ability to, well, I don't know if this is the right word, downgrade the charge or be kind of modify it based on all of the evidence that they have seen. Could you explain that to Yeah, me? it's also important to note those are two separate charges, sure. murder and manslaughter. Whereas manslaughter two is what's called a lesser included charge of manslaughter one. In other words, they're going to consider murder on its own, and then they're going to consider manslaughter one on its own. If they acquit on manslaughter one, or they can't agree on manslaughter one, then and only then do they consider manslaughter two. And do you think that might be a possibility here? Oh, I do. I think that's where the bulk of the jury's argument is going to be, is on manslaughter one and two. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. Yes, well, Josh. and the jury got a very extensive instruction about how to fill out these ver different verdict forms. You know, they have, for each defendant, they got two verdict forms they have to consider. It's and so six verdict forms in total. Yeah. Absolutely, definitely, and they are deliberating right now. Um, we know we have to stand by it and wait for the verdict. Um, you know, Judge, you have already touched on this, but how do you, how long do you expect the deliberation uh, to go on? We are kind of approaching the Christmas holiday. Um, we now know that if they don't come up with a verdict by 3 p.m. today, then it will uh, carry on through Monday. But if you were to predict how long do you think they might take with all of this? 
Well, if they don't have a verdict by 3 p.m., yeah, it'll go over. Uh, I, I, I gave up trying to predict what juries would do a long time ago because they, uh, every jury is different. Yeah. You know, I've had juries with, with long trials who spent less than an hour deliberating. Mm. And I've had other juries who had a very short trial spend more than, more than a few days deliberating. So every jury is different. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking they're probably going to go over the weekend. I don't, I don't know if there's been any more questions asked besides the several that we heard about yesterday. Sure. But those questions could show that they're really getting into this. There was one more this morning, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Very similar to the ones from yesterday afternoon. What does that indicate to you, I mean, especially as your experience as a judge, that they keep coming back with questions? What is that signaling to you? Well, I think it signals that they're not all on the same page there yeah, in the jury right. room. That's what it signals to me. Yeah. Uh, at least one of them, and probably more than one of them, have got some real questions about this whole thing. So actually, let's let's talk about this. Let's take a look at the makeup of the jury. We don't know a lot about these jury members, but we do know that there are seven white men, three white women, one black woman, and one black man. So, Craig, this is what I was referring to that I want to kind of get it into this when we were speaking about race. Does this makeup have any influence on the outcome, you think, based but on what you're seeing? It's tough to tell because uh, all people of all races are not all the same. Sure. And so what we'd have to really focus on is the individual and their, their common experience and the everyday experience and whether or not, based upon the issues that are presented in this case, they can be fair and impartial based upon their life experience. And so while race is something that I consider as I'm looking at a jury makeup, uh, it's not the only thing that I would consider. One thing we do want to ask, you know, when we think of other cases, for example, George Floyd sure. and also the death of Eric Garner, who had, has also been mentioned in this case, will that at all impact this decision? I mean, that's something that there's no, there's no denying that that is on people's minds yes. and certainly the jury's minds. What are your thoughts on that? I think that that is something that cannot be ignored. It is something that likely 10 of the 12, at least, of the jurors are aware of that case, and especially if, as it was mentioned in the trial. Yeah. But for me, I believe that the knowledge of those cases underscores the jury's importance on getting this right. And the, the importance of the jury looking at all the details and making the right decision based upon the facts of this case. Certainly, and we're talking three yeah. officers here as well. Um, one of the most significant cases that we've seen in, in a long time. Absolutely. Any uh, final thoughts on this? Um, as we are, um, like, we've wrapped it up. We're now waiting for the jury to come down with a verdict. Mark, did you have any final thoughts? Well, I will say this uh, along the lines of the jurors, and I think the three of us have probably all seen this, which is jurors take that oath yes. incredibly seriously. Sure. And they're not coming back today. They may not even come back next Friday. Uh, and at some point, they may come back and not be in agreement. And I suspect Judge Shushkoff will say, go back and try harder. Yeah. Uh, and they will. They're going to try to get to a verdict, and they're going to want to feel right about that verdict. They're going to want to be able to look back on the verdict a week from now, a year from now, and say, I did the right thing. So we have about a couple minutes left to talk about this. You had predicted last week maybe a hung jury. Do you still stand by that? Do you think that might be the case? Oh, I still think that's a high likelihood, yes. Yeah. But I, I hope that the judge does, in fact, send them back. And yeah. I hope they reach agreement, because I agree with what Judge Koshoff said, which is the community needs to hear from a jury. What, what is the process? How many times can they go back? Or do, can a judge tell them to go back and come up with a verdict? Well, there's again, there's no fixed standard for that. Mm. Uh, it's just going to be based on, well, first of all, the judge is likely to just ask the presiding juror the first time they come out um, this reasonable probability of a verdict question. Yeah. And then maybe on later on, if they come back out again on, with a, a note saying uh, we can't reach a verdict, he might poll the individual jurors. But you have to be very, very careful here yeah. because you don't want to do anything that invades the deliberations that are going on because that would, that'll trigger a mistrial all by itself. So it's, it's a very tricky area, but I agree with Mark. I, I'd be surprised if the judge automatically said, 
um, what do you think lawyers uh, shall we throw in the towel mm. because of what he said and what and what most judges want most judges want verdicts they want decisions yeah. yes. they don't want that's why you have a jury exactly <laughs> yes we, we want a verdict to come down certainly well a lot more to uh, see as we stand by to await for the jury's uh, verdict to come down thank you all of course as usual yeah, to you. parse it all out we so appreciate your insights thank you and uh, we will actually have live coverage once that verdict comes down as always you can keep up to date with any new information on king5.com and on our mobile app.